Welcome to another episode of Sasquatchers, everybody. This is episode 18, and tonight's guest is Byron Lacing. We will talk to him here shortly after the intro. The truth is out there. Never stop looking. Never be sheep. Always disrupt. We are the ungovernable. We are the truth seekers. We are Sasquatchers. Okay, everybody. As usual, it is Andrew and John, and we are talking to an awesome guest. We're excited to get into things. Uh, Byron is an author and an alien abductee. And I'm not going to butcher his story by trying to speak. And a musician. Him. And a musician. Also a musician. Uh, we will include his links in our description, as we always do. And you guys can go check it his stuff out. I did listen to it a while back when we first started chatting. I enjoy it immensely. Uh, how, how are you doing tonight, Byron? I'm doing very good. That's excellent to hear. Um, I want to thank you for coming on to the program. Uh, I know that's not always the easiest thing for some people to fit into their schedules. So uh, you have our gratitude. Um, I was looking over the materials that you had sent so that I could be refreshed for this conversation. And man, you just you have had so many experiences. And I don't think there's anything better than a good origin story. So if you don't mind, um, we can start at the beginning and uh, just see where the conversation goes. Sounds good. Awesome. Now, in, go ahead. In my book, in my book, it says that it started in 1955, but one day I suddenly realized that it actually started in 1956. I see. Okay. Um, what was your What was your first experience then at the at around the age of six that that um, that you experienced? Well, mom would always put me to bed and she would walk me into the bedroom and she would ask if I wanted the hall light on and I would usually say yes. I would always say yes. And she'd tuck me in and then she'd walk out of the room and I'd watch her leave and she'd turn off the light and then she'd be disappear down the hall. Well, one night... I turned around and she had left and there were three little men at the foot of my bed and their head and the tops of their shoulders were sticking up above the mattress and uh, the, the beds were higher. This was an old iron bed and they were higher than the ones are now that you buy. Even the ones for adults are higher off the ground. So I flipped out because there were three people in my room especially since they were so small and they looked strange. And I yelled for my mother and she came back in and I turned around and watched her come in and she, she asked me what was going on. And I, I told her and I turned around and the little guys were gone. And she tucked me back in and she told me to go to sleep and she didn't say anything. She didn't say I was dreaming she didn't say anything. She just put me back in bed and tucked me in and asked me if I wanted the light left on in the hall. And I said, yes. So the next night, the very same thing happened and it happened exactly the same way, all of it. And then the third night after she left, well, actually I skipped something. The third night, she sat down on the bed and she said, son, if this happens again, 
don't call me in here because they're not going to be here when I come in. You're just going to have to deal with them yourself. And then she tucked me in and left the room and I turned around and they were back. And also I noticed that there was a creature, a guy, he looked like a pirate. He looked sort of like Captain Hook. He had a, a big pirate's hat on. He had a vest like they wear or a coat like they wear. And I couldn't really see his legs very much. And he was sort of dancing around real weird which I later learned was actually the way he walks. And um, suddenly I couldn't move. It was like my hands were tied. I managed to move my head and I could see that my hands weren't tied and my legs weren't tied, but I couldn't move. The bed began to circle in the room, rotate in one place. And the little guys moved with me and the room got bigger and bigger and bigger. And um, this went on for just a few minutes. And the tall guy was still dancing around. And I was about to get really freaked out because I didn't like not being able to move. In fact, it's always uh, been difficult me, for me to be pinned down, especially after this event. I can imagine, uh, yeah. He, um, I was about ready to try and scream, and it was all gone. The room was the regular size. The bed was sitting where it was supposed to. The three little guys were gone. And um, I covered my head with another pillow that I had, and I pulled the covers over my head. And I went to bed like that ever since because I... They didn't really scare me, but they were strange. And if they came back the next night or any time, I didn't ever want to see them again. How long after those first interactions uh, did it take for them to, to come back? Uh, after that, I guess, the third night when your bed was spinning, when did you see them next? Now, I saw them next in 2009, but there were traces that I didn't understand, such as bruises, uh, punctures. Also, my life was saved about nine times before 2009 or eight times, and then a couple of times afterwards. So um, they were coming around. I just didn't know it. Okay, so uh, is the... The time you were hit by that car, I believe it was a, a Plymouth, if unless I'm mistaken. Uh, you were I you were still so. pretty young, and you were on your okay, and you're on a, on your bike pedaling, and uh, you did did you see anything coming before impact, or was it just like you suddenly had had an impact throw you? I saw the car. Now, I was in a line of bicycles. There were several in front of me and one or two behind me, but we were widely spread apart. And there was a policeman there to help us cross the road. But uh, I saw this car start. It crossed over the yellow line, and it was heading straight for me. And I didn't have the faintest idea what to do. And then all of a sudden, I was rolling on the ground, head over heels, and I would come up. And I would see the tire, then I would see the bumper, then I would see the headlight of the car, and then the sky. And I, this happened three times, and I couldn't move, which is probably good because I probably would have ended up killing myself if I could have moved. I rolled in front of the car perfectly, and then my body straightened out, and I flew between the top and the second wires of a barbed wire fence. And I got oh, wow. one little scratch. Yeah, there was a guy in 2009 that went through a barbed wire fence thrown out of a car, and he looked like he'd been through a cheese grater. He died. Yeah. And uh, I had this one little one-inch scratch in my arm, and my ankle was twisted. And I was laying down in the grass, because there was real tall grass in that side of the pasture. 
and the policeman was standing there and I started to get up and he put his hand on my chest and he pushed me back down on the ground and he said, don't move. And I said, I'm not hurt. I'm fine. And he said, you don't know. There might be something that doesn't even show up till tomorrow. I've already called your parents and the ambulance is going to pick up your mother and your father is going to meet you at the hospital. So sure enough, just right after that, the ambulance showed up and they picked me up. Mom was there and she was almost in tears. And uh, we drove to Kaufman, which is about 20 minutes away from Seagoville, where this happened. And when we got there, my dad shut up shortly afterward. It was it was my teacher's husband that hit me. Oh, I, that's yeah. uh, so I made awkward. I made an A. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah, it, you better have really passed. <laughs> really. And uh, the next day, well, that day she had come in early and she brought me a pot of tulips, which I had never really seen before, except on some glasses, you know, the kind of drinking glasses. They have a tulip pattern. I'd seen one or two of those and yeah. a box of divinity, which I had never had divinity. And I thought that it was fantastic. And they made me spend the night. The doctor said that there could be something that shows up the next day. And he gave me a had him give me a tetanus shot because of the scratch on my arm. Then the next day, well, my dad showed up, and that was about he stayed for a little while, and then he and mom went home, and I stayed there and watched TV and then went to sleep. <laughs> the next day they came to pick me up, and he said, Well, we've got your new bicycle. And I said, I, I don't want a new bicycle. I've got my bicycle. I like it. Now, bikes in those days were made out of steel, steel tubing. But it took a lot of force to bend it uh, and even more to break it. I mean, they weren't like the bicycles today made out of aluminum stuff. Well, I didn't want a new bicycle. And he said, well, just wait till we get home because he didn't want to argue with me. So we pulled up at the house about 20 minutes later, and there on the porch was a brand new red and white American flyer with a light blinkers, a pumper, streamers coming out of the handlebars, big bicycle. Uh, I thought that was fantastic. I'd always wanted an American flyer. And... Um, I said, now I've got two bikes. And he said, come with me. And he led me around the side of the house to the carport. And there leaning against the car, the wall of the house was my bike. And if you had looked at it from up above, it, it looked like a crescent moon. And uh, I laid it down on the floor and the seat was about a foot to a foot and a half off the ground whereas it should have been right on the ground or the concrete. And it was, it was hit, obviously, right where I was sitting. And uh, my father said that it was a miracle that there wasn't anything wrong with me. That was all he said. And he never says it, there's a miracle. I mean, it just wasn't his way of talking or thinking even. And... Uh, so they had to get rid of that bike. It wasn't usable. Yeah, I would imagine so. Uh, I'm I'm curious uh, because that your experience has started at such a young age, and I was I was thinking about what you had uh, mentioned that your mother had said when um, she said, you know, "Don't come get me again because they'll be gone by the time I get here." Uh, do you, do you think that, um, maybe your parents had some experiences with, uh, aliens and abductions prior to having you? I know that there is a lot of, uh, research that tends to suggest that it's almost like passed down to children or, or almost like hereditarily, um, uh, the, 
aliens move from parents to children as the generations continue to grow and move forward? Yes. In 1961, the same year, I, uh, mom put me to bed. This time she just walked me into the bedroom. She didn't tuck me in or anything. I was 11. And I lay down to go to sleep. And this new song that I had heard that I liked up until then, uh, which had come from England, it's called Does Your Chewing Gum Lose Its Flavor on the Bedpost Overnight? really long title well, that started playing in my head the minute i tried to close my eyes and it would not stop it played all night long and in the morning mom came and got me and said it's time for breakfast and you got to get ready for school so she turned around and left and went to the kitchen well i got up and got dressed and i went in and i said i don't think i can go to school mom i didn't sleep any last night and i told her what had happened and she just looked at me and she said okay and I said, what was that? And she said, I don't know. And then she put me on the sofa and she said, you're going to stay here all day and you're going to watch TV and you're not going to go to sleep because tomorrow you are going to school. And she gave me a soft drink to drink because we always got soft drinks and it had caffeine in it, of course. And lots of sugar so she goes back in towards the kitchen which is through the dining room and she gets the phone off the wall the the earphone to it and make it was a rotary phone makes a call and steps into the kitchen where i can't hear her what she's saying i can hear her talking but i can't hear what she's saying and then she comes out and hangs up so i watch tv all day i eat lunch all that kind of stuff about four o'clock my father comes in and he walks right past me and he doesn't really say anything and he takes my mother by the hand and he leads her into the kitchen and they have a discussion and i can't hear what they're saying then he comes out and he sits down on the sofa beside me i was still laying down watching the tv and he said son if you don't straighten up, we're going to have to take you to a psychiatrist. And I was shocked because, you know, I just heard a song playing in my head. I didn't think it was anything like that. And in 1961, it was a there was a very big stigma against going to a psychiatrist. You didn't even go to counselors and a psychologist. I mean, people would talk about you. It was like you didn't get a divorce. So he started this long speech. He told me that I didn't want to be famous. I didn't want people to know about me. I didn't want people to know what happened to me. He said, I don't even know what happened to my parents when I wasn't around because they didn't talk about it. He said, we Lacey's don't talk about ourselves. And uh, he said that I had a relative that in the 1890s, she was put in an insane asylum. And that's what they called it at that time. That's what they called it in the 60s. She was put in an insane asylum for seeing, for insisting that little men came into her room and talked to her at night. And he said, she died in there and you don't want that to happen to you. And that was pretty much the end of his speech. Well, in 2009, I went to Whitley Strieber's Dreamland Festival. I think it was in um, the town where Elvis lived when he was a musician. I can't remember the name of it, but there was a psychic. Um, channeler there that's probably not exactly the right word anyway she spoke with dead people and she had been a she had worked with a tv show that was a person a person about that as their reference 
and she had helped police. She had done all kinds of things. Her name was Marla Fries, I believe. And um, I knew she was going to be there, and I had taken a picture of my father with me because by then I knew this was about two months after I knew I was an abductee, and it was in 2009. And I wanted to talk to her and see if she could find anything out. Well, she she got the pick. I managed to be the second person she picked. She did like three people. And I had actually sat down in the very front row when it was usually my inclination to sit at the very back. And uh, I waved and everything. So she picked me. And I gave her the picture. And she said, well, you came prepared. And she took the picture. She never even looked at it. And she held it face against her leg, her upper leg, her right one. And she backed up and then she fell down and uh, she said that my father had pushed her and that he was trying to show me how he died so I would know it was really him. Now, he had died because he fell and broke his hip and they put him in the hospital and he refused to let him give you the decoagulation shot after he woke up from the anesthetic because he thought he was in a prisoner of war camp. And he didn't want him giving him any shot. And the next day, a blood clot let go in his leg and he died. So she was right about how he died. And I asked her to ask him if he knew about the aliens. And she said, I know everything. And, of course, my father thought he knew everything. And uh, so it was just like something he would say. And he, uh, then she said, you're a fourth generation abductee. It was your great grandfather, your grandfather, your father, and now you. And um, then she said, I want you to tell them. She told me to tell them about something and that and she turned around like she was talking to somebody. And I told this story and I can't remember what it was about at that time. And it wasn't important. But. Um, later that day at lunch, I went up to her and I thanked her for doing the reading for me. I told her it was very informative. And she said, well, I have a message for you. She said, your father told me not to tell you in front of everybody because you might get upset. And she said, he told me to tell. He told me to tell you that he's proud of you and that you're not aware of that. And I started to cry and I actually turned around. And I said, thank you and left. Yeah, well, that's an incredible experience for sure. Um, I can only imagine that the that your emotions were all over the place at that point. Um, not only to hear something like that, because it sounded like um, that might not have been something that you had heard from your, your dad much. But on top of that, to reach the validation of, of uh, finding out that you that you are an, in fact an abductee and that the things that have occurred to you um, actually did occur. I can only imagine what uh, you were going through in that moment. Um, insane emotions just flowing. I can only imagine. Um, if you um, didn't reach that conclusion until 2009 that you were in fact an abductee, um, how did you correlate all of your experiences throughout your lifetime up until that point to alien abduction? Well, I, I had told people all these stories and uh, they all thought guardian angels were looking after me. They all thought spirit, spirit guides were looking after me. They all had all kinds of explanations except aliens. So, I had this friend that I had known for several years and he had been researching 
the Illuminati, uh, aliens, the royal family, all kinds of stuff. Before there were even computers, he was doing it in books. And I had told him all of my stories, and he also always patiently listened to them. Well, that particular day, or the the day before, I was eating dinner in ha- in town, and it was about six o'clock, and it was winter time. It was getting dark. No, it wasn't. That was a different event. It was uh, doesn't matter. It was still light. I was in front of Walmart, and there's four lanes and a turn lane in front of Walmart, the biggest street going through town, North Street. And I was stopped at a stoplight, and this disc appeared in the air about the size of a dinner plate at the end of the stoplight above the turn lanes, and it expanded into about six to eight feet tall and six to eight feet wide. And it looked like it was made of swirling water or something. And it was like the Stargate that Kurt Russell was in the movie Stargate with Kurt Russell, but it didn't have a frame around it. And a a psychic later told me it was plasma, but it looked like water to me. I didn't even think about plasma. And I watched it, and I looked at the people around me. Nobody was staring at it. And I'd look at it, and I'd close my eyes and open them up, and it was still there. I'd turn my head, and it would stay right where it was. So I knew it wasn't in my head, or it would have moved with me, and uh, or I thought it would. And all of a sudden, it exploded into the air, and it fell down like drops of water, but it disappeared before it hit the ground. And the light changed, and we all left. I told my friend about it on the phone when I got home, and he didn't have anything to say, which was sort of weird. But um, then I went to bed or did whatever, watch TV. Then the next week, on the same day, the exact same thing happened. This time I didn't tell him about it, and... um, the next day, we would walk every day at the creek in town and through the park and everything because it's a nice long walk for exercise. And uh, I told him it happened again. And I told him about it, and he didn't say anything. And we, we got to his apartment, and we got inside, and I was getting ready to go home. But I said, hey, what do you think about what happened? You haven't told me. What do you think happened? And he said, do you want to know? I said, yeah, I want to know. That's why I'm asking you. He said, do you really want to know? I said, yes. He said, are you sure? I said, yeah, I'm sure. And he said, I think you're an alien abductee. And I said, you're crazy. What do you mean? And he said, and he just turned around and he wrote some things down on a piece of paper. And he said, look at these when you get home and he hands me this piece of of paper and I look at it and it's got three web addresses. So I go home and I fold it up and sort of crumple it up and toss it on my desk. And then I go watch TV and all week long, he'd keep going, have you looked at those websites? And I'd say, no, I'm going to. And finally, after about five days, I went, well, I'm going to go ahead and look at him because I'm tired of him bugging me. And the first one, it had 99 questions for you to answer. And it said, if you answer like 80% of them, you're probably an alien abductee and you might want to talk to somebody. Well, I think I got all but one and then the questions that were for women as a yes and then i looked at the next website and it was the same thing and i did the same thing again i answered all the questions yes and on the third side i saw the questions and i didn't even mess with them but i got this thing about um i can't remember what it's called it's where your nerves get real jangled by something and it it PTSD. It was about PTSD, and for some reason it looked inviting. 
So I clicked on the link and read about it, and I go, dang, I've had PTSD almost all my life. And uh, so it gave some hints as to what to do about it, and basically I ignored it. But the next day I went and talked to him, and I told him, yeah, I think I'm an alien abductee. So we talked about it some, and he told me some more stuff. And he said it was sort of funny that every time he would show a video from YouTube about aliens or spaceships, I would fall asleep. And I thought that was weird, too, because I never sleep during the daytime. Well, um, and I'd been sleeping at his house for a couple of years whenever that he'd put those on because I'd lay on the bed and he'd sit in his chair. And uh, he told me he wanted me to go to this Dreamland Festival about a week or two later. And I thought that that sounded like a good idea. And I also started searching for somebody close by to talk to. And I found a man named Daryl Sims, the alien hunter who lived in Houston. And he had a website and an email. So I dropped him an email and told him a little bit about me and about what had happened at different times. And I heard back from him and we became friends and I talked with him a lot through email. And then I eventually met him and I've talked Later on, a couple of years later, I talked at one of his meetings. Um, but anyway, I digress. So I went to Memphis or wherever Elvis was and did that Dreamland Festival. And I came back and I got to thinking, I have implants. I'm bound to have implants. And if I do, that means they can see everything that's happening. They see everything I see. They hear everything I hear. And they know everything I think. And if that's the case, and they're taking me, then they must be getting something from me. And I think this relationship should be reciprocal. Like saving my life wasn't enough. So anyway, I decided I decided I was going to think a specific question at them every day, all day long. And one way or the other, they'd probably do something because I'd drive them crazy asking the same thing. And I went and walked out under the electric line that runs past my house because it's a clearing through my forest. And uh, I've got two acres and half of it or more is woods. So I walk back and forth, back and forth. And I would go, I want to know what's happening. I ask a lot of things at first, but I boiled it down to, I want to know what's happening to me. I want to know if you're taking me. I want to know if I'm crazy because at that time I was still worried that I might be nuts instead of abducted. And I did that for five days or four days, four days or five days. And then that night, which was a Friday night, I was playing a gig for the first time in years since I was in high school. I was going to sing some country songs at the restaurant and came in there and started, I went in there and I started my set. There was about 20 people in there. And I started forgetting the words to all the songs and I would make up the words. Of course, they all knew what the words were because they were all country music fans. But at my break, this guy comes out of the audience who ended up being a very close friend of mine and teaching me to play bass guitar. Uh, Jimmy Daniels, he said, look, I'm a guitar player and uh, I've done it professionally. You give me your guitar and you get your words out of your guitar case and we'll finish up your set. You can just sing. So we did, and it went great. Then I went home, and it was close to midnight. I needed to go to sleep. So I um, I got in bed. I turned over, turned over, turned over, turned over. Couldn't go to sleep because I was still excited from playing in front of everybody. And uh, I put on a CD for meditation, 
that had an entrainment tag track in it. And I was listening to it because I thought, well, if I don't go to sleep, I'll at least meditate and I'll still benefit some from it. And uh, so I got really relaxed. And then all of a sudden I was in a hammock. But it, it was hung from side to side instead of end to end. It was hung side to side and I was in it and it was made out of some strange material that looked like thick parchment or leather or something. I don't know what it was. And I reached up above me and grabbed hold of the opening and I pulled myself out and I realized I didn't have any clothes on. And then I thought about the fact that I didn't have any clothes on when I went to bed. And then I, everything looked blurry and I reached up to get my glasses to clean them. And I didn't have my glasses on and I don't wear them in bed. And I went, holy crap, I'm in a spaceship. And I got elated by this thought. And then I heard there was an opening over to one corner away from me. And there were two other or three other hammocks in the room with me. I think there were two more. Nobody seemed to be in them. I heard this noise and I went, oh, expletive. I don't think I'm ready to see aliens right now. And it, then everything just faded to black, like in a movie, faded to black and then came back up. And I was laying on this metal table and there were three little guys at the end of the table on the side, just like the ones that had been there in Anthony near El Paso when I was in 56. No, I mean in Seagaville in 56. We had come from Anthony and um, and there was this thing, this guy about seven feet tall standing over to the side, only he wasn't Captain Hook and he had this big head and he looked like a praying mantis wearing a robe and uh, I, I heard his voice in my head and he said, and this was about the time I was getting ready to freak out. He said, don't be afraid. And instantly I wasn't afraid. And it wasn't because of what he said. He had actually controlled my nervous okay. system. Then somehow my consciousness split into two things. And one of them was in the ship and one of them was in the bed. And uh, Dar I told this to Daryl. And he told me that they can they can do anything to you psychologically they want to. And they probably did that so you would be calmer, that they could make you see from the bed, even though you were in the ship. And because uh, they can uh, control your perceptions. That's so. Do you, do you remember do you remember what the uh, the inside of the ship looked like? No, it was it was just very plain gray walls. It was like gray all over. There wasn't much to it. And I couldn't see well without my glasses. But sure. suddenly I could see me laying there on the table. And then the picture changed to black and white. And the it closed in to where I could only see me from my neck to my knees laying on that table. I couldn't see the three guys and I couldn't see the praying mantis and it changed to x-ray and I could see inside of myself. I could see my organs. I could see everything. And then I saw a tube and they did the anal probe on me. And uh, then I was awake in my bed and I turned over and went to sleep, which was weird because I never just go to sleep especially after something strange like that has happened, but I did, and I was even happy. The next morning, I woke up, and I opened my eyes, and then I went, wow, I was on a ship last night, and I started crying, which was odd because I was happy, but here I was crying, and I cried for about 30 minutes and couldn't stop, and I didn't know why, and then I, I got a piece of paper, and I drew 
a drawing of the the mantis creature and i didn't know that's what he was at that time later that day i went over to my friend's house and i told him what had happened and i said of course this was just a dream and i've got proof because this guy that i saw and i handed him the paper i said this guy doesn't exist i've never seen him in any of the things you show me nothing and he took it and he turned around to his computer and clicked in some keys and then he moved back and he said look and there was a drawing done by a child that looked exactly like my drawing and it said it was a mantis being Whew. wow again almost experiencing like instant gratification i would imagine is something that in that moment like mixed in with confusion and uh, there had to have been at least some kind of understanding that um it's real you know this is happening and i st i can't uh, again i can't imagine this uh, I'm, I'm at a loss for words at at this story honestly um i i even I had a question about the mantis and it's just completely gone now because uh are you still are you still friends with uh this guy who was helping you through all of this no no um that was bad i see <laughs> uh did you ever experience other instances uh, with with the mantis, uh, did, did this happen again, or was this maybe just like a one time thing where that uh, you were uh, cognitive to what was happening? I um, I remembered his voice, and I remembered that I had heard his voice several years before. And in fact, he took me to the light. Um, I was doing this experiment because I thought you ought to be able to be able to get out of your head and go to where people go when they die, but not die. Except I was at a really low point in my life and in a way I wanted to die. But I considered it being a necronaut and I would get into really deep trances and try try to leave my body. And one one day I got home. And it was not, and I went in, went into the bed, and this voice said, "You're going to be given the opportunity to die." And I go, "What?" And I thought, "This is the weirdest thing I've ever thought in my life." I, th I thought it was me thinking it, even though I knew it wasn't me thinking it. So I go to bed. the The next night, it happens again. The third night. It didn't happen. And I went, oh, good. Okay, I've let go of that. So I got in bed and I got really relaxed. And all of a sudden, I couldn't tell that I was breathing. I couldn't tell that my heart was beating. I couldn't feel my body. And this wall of light just lit up right beside me. I, I could have reached over and touched it, except I didn't seem to have any hands. And uh, things started leaving me, psychological hangups, um, negative things, all those things started leaving me, everything from my childhood, uh, all my burdens, that's one way to put it, it just all left. And I felt myself getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And suddenly I was about the size of a pencil, pencil lead. And I felt better than I'd ever felt before psychologically. And um, I had this feeling that I could move into the light that was next to me. But for some reason, I didn't. it didn't dawn on me that it was the light. And I, I thought I could move into it. But then I thought, well, what if I can't get out? <laughs> or what if I was having a heart attack or something? I'm like 15 miles from town. By the time I managed to call an ambulance and then get here, I'd probably be dead. I said, I'm not going to go. And this boy suddenly goes, huh, 
you've wanted this. And now that I've gone to the trouble to get it for you, you're not going to go. And it laughed three times. And the first time it laughed, aha, the, the wall of light turned into a sphere of light. And then it shrank with the second laugh and shrank and exploded and was gone with the third laugh. And I was wide awake. That's, um, that's fascinating. Uh, I think that almost lines up with, um, are you familiar with Dr. Lear at all? Uh, he was on coast to coast with Art Bell many times. Uh, John, I think his name is John Lear. And he was, I don't know much about him. He was, um, he was postulating that, um, the aliens are are very real and they are very much already here and that uh he he was one of the first to um break the news of the reptilians and i do believe that he talked about mantis uh versions of the um the aliens as well and another thing that he really famously talked to art bell about was that the light is actually a trick. And that was something that struck a chord with Art Bell to the point where he spoke about it off and on for the next 30 years or so, uh, up until, I mean, his final shows on Midnight in the Desert, uh, he would always uh, make that a reference point. And as a fan of that show, um, it's kind of always kind of been ingrained in my head because it was always talked about. And so my question now is with everything you've experienced and learned over the years, do you think that was nefarious? Do you think that was a trick or do you think it was something that was genuinely meant to help you? Well, first off, I think they knew that I wouldn't go but they would have let me and I probably would have stayed um, because they, they seem to know our past, present and future all the time. There've been ha things happened to me that there's no way they could have saved me without knowing it was going to happen and be there. And um, I think that when you go through the lot, you meet your relatives and all that stuff and you're there. But I think that's where you fall into the reincarnation machinery and you come back here. And uh, I, tur I turned away. I didn't go and nothing bad happened to me. And I think when I die, I'm going hopefully to not go in. So almost like it, to enter the light then is to be reincarnated, return, do it over again. But um, you think or hope that there's a second option, so to speak, so that you can maybe ascend higher than that and not have to go through it. Right. Uh, that's a, have you ever read um, Many Lives, Many Masters by chance? No. It's a it's a really good book that uh, that covers all of that. It was one of the first forays that I had um, on the subject. And before I had read that book, I I never would have considered reincarnation as something uh, that that existed at all. And by the time I was finished with it, I was like, this is absolutely happening. This is 100 percent true. I can't remember the author of the book off the top of my head, but that was that was an incredible book. I, I highly recommend it. Um, another question that I have, because it's of great, great interest of mine, and I wasn't expecting you to bring it up. You had mentioned uh, trying to leave your body, and uh, out-of-body experiences um, are something that not only do I uh, really enjoy learning about, I had a I have had experience one myself and it took only a couple of days of practice for me to achieve it. And once I did it, I found myself looking at the, my ceiling and I realized, you know, the ceiling is way too close. What's going on? And then I looked down and I saw my body 
And I immediately got scared. And I was like, oh, my God, I just died, man. And uh, I snapped back into my body and I woke up. But uh, I know out-of-body experiences tend to sometimes go hand in hand with uh, alien uh, abductions. Not even necessarily that, that one causes the other, but can sometimes be misinterpreted as the other. So I was curious if you had any other experiences uh, with OBEs. I've, I've had two OBEs where I tried to astral project and managed to do it twice. Now I've been taken out of my body by the aliens. Uh, in fact, the, the biggest experience I've ever had or the most important to me was uh, I was getting these psychic readings from a psychic in England and she would send me an MP3. I get sent her some numbers, uh, maybe a color, my birthday, all this kind of information and some questions. And she, I got readings for three years. The first two years went by and at the end of the year, everything Everything she had said would happen, it happened. The second year, everything she said would happen, happened. So it was close to the end of the third year, and everything had happened except one thing, and it couldn't really happen. Uh, and that's, she said, you know, yes, you're an abductee, but you don't realize this, but you're one, you may think I'm crazy for saying this, but you're one of them. And she laughed and um, I thought maybe, and I had known this ever since I got the reading for a year, but I thought, nah. and um, I thought, well, maybe there's something to it because everything she's told me for three years has happened. So I got into a very relaxed state. I got into a meditative state. I thought about how I didn't fit in with my family. I thought I didn't fit in with society. I mean, I felt like a baby left on my parents' step and all this other stuff. I didn't believe the way most people believe. And uh, I feel different. And suddenly, emotionally and intellectually, I believed it to be totally true. And at that point, I felt two fingers reach into the very back of my skull above my spine and grab me and pull me out of my body and I was a sphere and I no longer had any contact with my body and I was in total blackness there were no phosphines in my eyes or anything and then a grid of light appeared a, across part of the vast infinity of blackness and then three men or three beings made of light on you know, thrones made of light and they looked like they would have been about eight to 12 feet tall if they were standing up appeared against that grid and i believe it was just a focal point for me and i could actually see 360 degrees actually or spherically but i can't even comprehend of that now and um, I was this little spear. And this voice said, the council of three. And I knew that he was introducing them. And it wasn't one of them. And then, and that was just in my head. There was nobody there. Then one of them said, we're very proud of you. We've been waiting for you to discover this. And then information just started pouring into my head and it sounded like or seemed like the way when you used to dial up to get on the internet, all this screeching and screaming, okay. everything was going in so fast. I could barely remember it. Although some of it has come back as time has gone by and I remembered one thing and then everything was gone and I was in my bed wide awake. And the one thing I remember at that point was that um, they had said the interest on your debts are the chains of your slavery. 
And so wow. I said about getting out of debt right then. I started putting every extra penny onto one debt at a time until after two years, I got debt free. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. uh, real quick, I have a question in relation to timing of this. Um, when this occurred in relation to the, uh, I believe you said 2009 uh, psychic reading that you had where your father had said that he was proud of you. Uh, I was curious if those two things happened at a similar time, because with what you said, uh, with uh, her saying that you were a fourth generation abductee and that, um, you know, all of the men in your family above you had experienced this. And I was almost curious if this like council of three m may have been like actual relatives of yours or possibly the um, a alien form of your father, maybe is, is that uh, out of the realm of possibility? I, I don't think so. No. Nah. Their voices were different. I have spoken to him. I've spoken to like three or four dead deceased people and uh, his voice was the same. I've spoken to my mother. Her voice was the same. I've spoken to a complete stranger. So I don't know if her voice was the same or not, but she told me several things that I told her mother and she said, that was my daughter. Wow. That's it's an incredible story. Um, have you ever uh, spoken to or are, are you aware of the works of Preston Dennett? Because he is a researcher and author who um, delves in all of this stuff. Uh, a lot of what you're saying, he would be very knowledgeable um, if you ever uh, needed uh, to outsource anything. Uh, he's his work is is very very uh, uh researched he's a, he started in mufon back all you know in the 80s and everything that that you've said is stuff that he's covered with the correlation between out of body experiences and uh, the abduction stuff and i do remember in the materials you sent you had pointed out that you saw a craft while you were at school and like your whole class, like all of your classmates also saw this craft. He has, he has two books about specifically uh, alien encounters at schools. Uh, so uh, if you're, if you're not, not familiar with him, like if you're ever bored, you know, he'd be someone to uh, check out for sure. I think you would, uh, identify a lot with with the works that he's put out i guess is what i'm saying i've seen his name i've seen is he on facebook oh yeah yeah he uh he's he's on I've facebook. seen his name he's, on facebook he's he's active you know he's still putting books out and uh for you know being involved with this for as long as he has he's still you know rel relatively young starting in the 80s uh, but yeah this um this is an incredible story and unfortunately we're not able to get through all of it at least tonight i would love to have you on again sometime byron so that we could we can continue Absolutely. to talk about this stuff um it's i did i did, just i want to add one thing to the uh to while the discussion about the um uh the mantis uh was was going on as i remembered so i had to look it up but i remembered that they've um found quite a few um ancient carvings and things of mantis people in places like southern africa and ancient mesopotamia and that so like there's a historical precedence for these mantis individuals <laughs> they're really smart they're like the smartest thing I've ever seen in my life or heard. I mean, you can just feel their their intellect and their intelligence when they think thoughts at you. 
when you're away from it, um, I know you said that in it in its presence, they're able to just immediately put that calming uh, sensation over to you and almost kind of control the situation. But when you are away from that, do you still feel that same level of calmness? Or is it something that in retrospect, while, while you're pondering on it, it, it might be something more um, sinister or, you know, anxiety inducing? When I first realized after I got, after I got back from Memphis or whichever town it was, I started making a list of everything that had happened to me. And I started realizing that everything that had happened to me wasn't guardian angels. It were the aliens. And I saw in there that eight or nine times they had saved my life. And I wouldn't be here if it weren't for them. And at that point, I was glad they were saving me. I was glad they were around. And I lost yeah. all worry about it. Absolutely. That's, that's definitely a, a good positive outlook. They're obviously keeping an eye on you for a reason. Uh, you know, it's funny, as you're telling this story, there's, there's a lot that correlates almost to uh, instances in my own life. Uh, I've often had a lot of similar experiences that I'd never even dwelled upon as being anything more than just luck. I myself have been hit by a car dead on as a child um the bike was destroyed and i was fine i was pulled underneath the car that happened when i was in kindergarten later on in life i i was in several car accidents including being struck by a mac truck and i walked away from that that day i left the hospital um uh things were very minimal and so i'm starting to kind of ponder if and maybe there might be something more than than just strange luck in in my own near death experiences. I'm gonna have to take a look at that. Maybe try to do some uh, regression therapy or, or something. But uh, ultimately, then you know they've saved your life, and you're not fearful of it. So there's certainly uh, a positive incantation to what is what's happening. Uh, so. Do you have anything um, other than your books or, or anything that you'd like to promote, discuss, talk about real quick before we let you go? I always like to give our guests the opportunity to you know, talk about what they're working on. Well, I have my book that's on Amazon and I do uh, experimental electronic music that was inspired by some music that started playing through my CD player and it wasn't on my CD. Now, instead of using synthesizers, they actually used orchestra instruments, but they were playing all random stuff, except it, it had this kind of order to it that made it more beautiful than our songs. And, for two years, I tried to figure out how to do that, and suddenly I went, saw a synthesizer for sale, and I bought it, and I started making records. And uh, that's on YouTube, Amazon, Spotify, Apple. Uh, it's on 50 to 100 different places. And uh, it is avant-garde. Now, my earlier al albums, I've been listening to one of them called Learning to Live with Rockets. And I've realized that my earlier, my earlier pieces still had parts of melodies in them. And in, in fact, I remembered at one point I went, I wanted to get away from melodies. I've got to force myself to do it. Now, they're not melodic like regular songs, but they've still got some in there. And I actually like them now. I, so I those are good. think I listened to that very album on YouTube, actually. Mm -hmm. Yep. It has a Fine. great cover. I only had one rocket. I had to take 12 pictures and layer them and finally just get it to what it is. 
Yeah, I like I like all of your music that I've that I've listened to on YouTube. I highly recommend everybody else seek them out. I think the artwork that you uh, accompany them is always really interesting to look at as well. Uh, definitely check out uh, his books, and um, we're gonna hold on to you just for a couple of minutes to make sure all of the audio and video is all uh, set to go. And again, mm -hmm. I want to thank you so much for coming on and, and even just yes, giving us you. a piece, a piece of your story because it's, it's incredible. And anyone listening should absolutely, you know, take this as a teaser and look into his works, go to Amazon, get the book and, and read everything that he has to say. But um, until next time, everybody, thanks for squashing. Squatch you later. <laughs>